Welcome to Yahweh's Assembly and Messiah in Rocheport, Missouri. It's good to see all of you out on this Sabbath, the beautiful Sabbath day. And I uh, want to thank you all for coming out. And if you'll stand and join with me, I'll offer an opening prayer. Father Yahweh, thank you for calling us out of the world and into your marvelous light. And Father, we thank you for this this nice place we have to worship you where we have heating and cooling and we can enjoy the creature comforts here in this, this sacred hall. Father, we thank you for putting your name upon us and your protection and we just ask that you take charge of this service and bless those who are bringing spoken ministry or music ministry and uh, those bearing testimonies later on. We just pray that your spirit would move each one of us to edify and uh, to bring your your guidance upon us. Father, we thank you, and we just ask that you be among us on this, this day. In the name of Yahshua Messiah, hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, well, this is the biblical day, is the third day of the seventh month, and on man's calendar, the Gregorian, uh, would be September 7th, 2024. And uh, the scripture to start us off with, or our call to worship, if you will, comes from Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3, paraphrased a bit. It says, See how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Yahweh gives the blessing, even life forevermore. Hallelujah. Well, if you able to, remain standing and sing with us, and I'll turn it over to the musicians at this point.
asked Jeff Henderson if he'd come up and read Numbers chapter 12 is where we're at. It's a short chapter, so we all ought to be able to stand for that one. Numbers chapter 12. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath Yahweh indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And Yahweh heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh spoke suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam. 
come out, you three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And Yahweh came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of Yahweh shall he behold. Wherefore, wherefore then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against him, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, Alas, my sovereign, I beseech you, lay not this sin upon, this sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried unto Yahweh, saying, Heal her now, O El, I beseech you. And Yahweh said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, she should not be ashamed. Seven days, let her be shut out from the camp, seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not until Miriam was brought in again. And afterward, the people removed from Hazaroth and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Oh. 
city gates of Jerusalem one day came Yahshua on a donkey he rode by there was a feeling in the air excitement everywhere and all around the crowd began to cry the king is passing by oh the king is passing by blessed be his name son of the most high let everyone rejoice well let's praise him with our voice hosanna The blinded eyes can see, the captive are set free, the lame can walk when the king goes by. A heart that's black with sin, well, he can make it white again. All your needs are met when the king goes by. The king is passing by, oh, the king is passing by. Blessed be his name, son of the most high. And everyone rejoice, well, let's praise him with our voice. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. The captives to Zion. We were like men who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues were from the door. From the door. From the door. Without further ado, I want to welcome up uh, Elder Mike Wardlow and say it is always a pleasure to have oh, yeah. this brother with us. Praise hey, Yahweh. Hey, yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Most High. Yeah. 
I'm going to go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Yah, we thank you for, uh, for this day, dear Father, Yah. I pray today, dear Father, Yah, that your words, dear Father, Yah, will be a blessing to not only myself, but those who are here. In Yahshua's precious name, we say thank you. Hallelujah. 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 All right, so praise Yah. Today, uh, we're, we have a sermon that is, is, is entitled Spiritual Keys to Prayer. And um, I want to remind you that I thought I was doing a sermonette. So, but that's okay. That's okay. Praise Yah. We're prepared. Yah's here. All right. Well, spiritual, uh, spiritual keys to prayer. First of all, I want to give my definition for, uh, for prayer. Prayer is simple. Prayer is having a conversation with my father. There's nothing lofty or technical. This is an emotional conversation between me and our father. That's what it is. And if you can really grasp that, then you are way ahead of the game. You're way ahead of the game. I see most people like to try to make it into this as if Yahweh is somewhere that he cannot be reached. And they speak in different forms and all this kind of stuff. And I say, stop it. Stop it. He's right here. Can y'all hear me? Normally I can hear myself up here and I'm, I'm not here. So I'm going to start screaming in a minute. <laughs> mm. All right. So praise y'all. All right. Yahshua. Yahshua's disciples wanted to. They saw the work that he was doing. And they said, you know what? We want the inside scoop on what he's doing, how he's able to come out into public and work miracles when we're struggling at it. And so I'm quite sure that prompted them to ask him here in Luke chapter one. They asked him. This question. In Luke chapter one. They said. And it came to pass that as he was praying, having a conversation with his father in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. The first thing I noticed here was that Yahshua was already praying. He was already in a conversation with his father long before his disciples ever probably even got up. Hallelujah. And after this, Yahshua led them into what many consider today as the master's prayer or the Lord's Prayer, however they say it. But we're not gonna do that today because he already taught you how to pray. What I'm going to do today is basically run over some of the pitfalls that we run into or some of the kind of crazy thinking that we have that makes our prayer life not so effective. So we're gonna do that today. We're just gonna bullet point some uh, different things that we struggle with today and uh, help us out in this prayer situation. All right, let's go to, uh, first of all, let's go to Matthew chapter six, verse six, because it further, further uh, illustrates what Yahshua was just saying. It further, further illustrates, let's go to six, Matthew six, verse six. Chapter six, verse six. He says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. 
And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And the father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Basically, what he was saying to his disciples, if you want to walk in Yahweh's power publicly, you first must have a relationship with him in private. You see, when he came out from the prayer, Yahshua was revved up. He was on fire. He was ready to go, ready to demonstrate what him and his father was talking about was ready to demonstrate the glory of the Father. He had a full tank of gas. And his disciples were sitting on empty. Like myself and many others do today. Sometimes we're running on empty when it comes time to speak to our Father. Okay. You know, when uh, I have a, when you are in need of a healing, you must show up. If you're showing up for a healing, show up believing that your father wants to heal you. That your, your present condition, you realize that that is not your father's desire for you. It's not. He wants you healed. So much so that Isaiah tells us what happened and what he allowed his son to go through for us to receive that healing. Isaiah 53. Verse 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. This is how much your father wants you to be healed. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. What Yahweh wants us to do is to receive that. Receive it. Receive it meaning to believe it. There are, just believe it. There are many today who believe that for some reason that Yahweh is not serious about healing us. I would ask you to turn over to Isaiah 52. Verse 14, that would tell you how serious Yahweh is about your healing. Isaiah 52, verse 14, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. The stripes that Yahshua received for your healing reduced him to a pile of mush. You could say it was ground beef. That's the stripes that Yah allowed him to go through for your healing. For your healing. He's serious about healing you. Receive that. He said he was more and more than any man. Listen. Many of us miss out on the opportunities for healing falsely believing Yah doesn't love his saints. I mean, I, I used to go through that. You know what? I, I've done some things. You know, Yah doesn't love me. And blah, blah, blah. I, I might have messed up here and there. 
Well, Romans 8, 37 tells me something. Romans 8, 37, Romans 8, 37 says this. It says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is the Messiah, Yahshua, our master. You know, I was just thinking, I said, all of us sin and fall short of Yah's glory at one time or another. He said that. And he said, whoever says that they are not sinning calls him a liar. I'm not going to say that. That's when you take it to your father and say, hey, father, I messed up. That's when you have that conversation with him. I messed up, father. I messed up. Let's have that conversation. And he will straighten you up. Praise Yah. You know, I see also that uh, some of us also falsely believe that Yah only, Yah only gave this power to his ministers or his pastors or his preachers or teachers, and he left everyone else out of the out of the pocket. And so we have people that won't demonstrate what Yah has already given you that you would travel miles to go see a pastor when you have the ability to do exactly what you're seeking from a minister. We don't have no more power than you. We don't. We don't. You have this power. Let us go to John chapter 14 verse 12. John chapter 14, verse 12. It says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. We're going to start right there. He or her that believeth on me. The works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whosoever ye shall ask, or whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be esteemed in the Son. And to further illustrate this point, would you please go over to Mark, Mark 16, because this one here really... I, when, when I read it, I, I had to reread it again, and I've heard it a thousand times. You know, these scriptures I always tell you, you're not going to hear a scripture that you haven't heard before. You've heard them a thousand times. But what Yahweh is saying to you is give it time and sit on it, and you may receive a revelation. It's the revelation that you should be interested in receiving. I don't care how many times you hear a scripture. You're going to learn something if you open yourself up to receive. Many people hear a scripture, they say, oh, I already know that scripture, and they dismiss it. Well, then you don't get the revelation. That's fine. Here it is again, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, preach the good news to every creature. Verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized. He that believeth and is baptized. Shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And here's the powerful part. For you who believe and were baptized. I believe that's everyone here. This is for you. He said, and these signs shall follow you that believe in my name, and they shall cast out devils, 
They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's you. That's you. Those who believe and are baptized. I don't mind laying hands on you, but I'm saying to you, you can lay hands on yourself. You have that power. You have that authority. And this is why we need to lay in the scriptures. I'll get to that later on. Hallelujah. I'll get to that later on. But this is powerful if you want it, if you want it, if you believe it, if you could receive it, it's powerful. Hallelujah. Another bullet point. You must show up for prayer, believing wholeheartedly that your heavenly father is the ultimate father. I'm going to say that again. You must show up if prayer and healing is what you want. Please show up believing that your heavenly father is the ultimate good father. How many fathers we have in here? How many fathers? Wow. Bless you. Bless you. Listen here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7 to you fathers and for some of you mothers who act like fathers. This is for you too. Matthew chapter 7 verse 9. When I finally read this a, a, a thousand times and I finally, it finally dawned on me what it was saying. It took all these years for me to receive this revelation. And I've read this scripture a hundred times. Listen here, it said Matthew chapter seven, verse nine. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will give him a stone. Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Stop. Fathers, if your child asks you for a piece of bread, would you give him rocks? Would you give him rocks? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't think of giving him rocks. Your father says to you, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? He is the ultimate father. When we come to him, come to him expecting great things from a father. You know, years ago, I had a little quarrel with my mother. I was a little sassy little teen. And I needed to go to this little house party that was around the corner. Oh, I was big then. I said, Mama, I need a quarter to get in this house party. She said, son, I don't have no quarter. And I huffed and puffed and went outside and sat on the stoop. And she come up from behind. She said, I see you fretting out here. She says, son, have you ever considered how much it hurts me 
that I couldn't give you 25 cents. You know how much that had to hurt her? I didn't appreciate that then until I became a father. Does that make sense? I wouldn't dream of giving my child rocks if he asked me for a piece of bread. That's what Yahweh is telling us. We must come to him as if we know our own selves we wouldn't do it. He's the ultimate father. Come to him expecting good things, and he'll give it to you. But you have to believe that. That's the revelation I got. After a hundred times reading that scripture, because I opened myself to receive something, I pray some of you open your hearts to receive. Isn't that simple, though? Isn't that a simple little illustration that Yah gave us? Don't come to me as if I'm nobody. He has feelings too. Just like my mother had feelings when she couldn't give me what I asked for. 25 cents. Makes me feel bad. Mama, if you hear me, I apologize. I apologize. I get it now. I apologize. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. All right. All right. Some of us also falsely believe that if they don't see immediate results, their prayer wasn't answered. And they give up. Is there anybody? Come on now. I mean, I, I, I did the same thing. I prayed for something big and I didn't get it. And I said, oh, man, he's not listening to me. I'm going to have to go get this on my own. And I never ended up, well, anyway. Listen, he knows. He knows. He knows you. He knows me. And I believe that if I didn't see immediate results, man, I'm like, I'm gone. I didn't see nobody raise their hand. That's sad. Tell the truth. <laughs> I'm the only one. <laughs> I'm the only one. Ooh, wait. Y'all good. Y'all a whole lot better than I am. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> All right. Listen. For those of you who think that way, I want you to consider this. Go to Mark chapter 8, and you're going to see if Yahshua had that. This is Yahshua. Gave a powerful example of persistence. Don't give up because you didn't see immediate. Listen, Mark chapter 8, verses 23. And Yahshua and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. There's a reason why he led him out of town, too, but that's another subject. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw. He said, boom. Do you see something? Can you see? <laughs> what did the man say? He said, he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Wrong, 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 wrong. Uh-uh. That's not how you should be seeing. Yahshua understood that. He said, men, he can't, men don't look like trees. So he went back. He said, after that, he put his hands again upon him. His eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. He didn't give up because he didn't see an immediate. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? He went back and did it again. And that's what Yah is telling us to do. If we want to be successful in our prayer life, when we pray, 
for either ourselves or somebody else. Stop taking this position that you didn't see immediate results. You know how much things happen behind the scenes? Oh my goodness, Has everybody has seen a drop a seed in the ground and stand there and watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it. You don't know what's going on up under the ground. But something is happening. The moment you pray, something is happening. You may not have the faith for a miracle. Your faith level may be a continual, gradual healing. Do you understand that? You might just have the faith for a gradual healing. That's what you're going to get. But nevertheless, it's a healing. Never deny a healing because you don't see immediate reaction. Stand up and say, hallelujah, I'm healed. I may still walk with a little limp, but I tell you what, I'm getting strong about a day. Because I refuse to give up. I'm fighting for my healing. I'm fighting. Just like this widow. And Yahshua said, I want you to watch this woman. And, and, and see, this is how I want you to attack your prayers. Go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. He said, this is what, you see what, you see that woman? This is what I need you to do. You see what that judge just did? This is what I need you to do. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable, this is Yahshua speaking, unto them to this end. He said that men ought always to pray. See, there it is. Men ought always to pray. Keep praying. Keep having a conversation with your father. That's all it is. It's a conversation. Don't be afraid to have a conversation. He said, he said the men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't faint having a conversation with your father. Listen, he says, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not Elohim, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, avenge me of mine adversaries. And he would not for a while. But afterwards, he said within himself, though I fear not Elohim, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Huh? I'm going to give her what she asked for because she won't give up. Ooh, I know some of you mothers understand that. Huh? Persistent. That's how he wants you to be in your prayer life. Persistent. You see, and the master said, verse six, and the master said, hear what the unjust judge said. He wants you to take notice of what the judge, what the judge said. He said, do you hear what that judge just said? Look, and, El and he said, and shall not Elohim avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Oh, man. You give up one day of praying and think that's it. Yahweh said, there's many more days. Keep on praying to me. Keep, if nothing else, it'll keep you in communication with him. You'll always have somebody to talk to. Huh? Keep talking. Keep praying. Hallelujah. Y'all all right? You know what? I know. I know. Hallelujah. I know. I'm going to give you another scripture about being persistent. It's coming. Go to Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. 
Luke chapter 11, verse 9. We're talking about this persistent thing. Look what it says. Ooh, he said, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Oh, my goodness. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open unto him. Hallelujah. Have you asked? And then after you ask, are you seeking? And then after you're seeking, are you knocking on that door? Huh? That's right. Knock that door down. Hallelujah. Knock it down. Don't give up. Oh, we, Yahweh's trying to share something with you. I receive it from the moment I ask for it. I claim it. But I still get up daily and ask for the same thing. Isn't that something? Huh? Somebody might say, well, that sounds like a crazy person. <laughs> well, call me crazy. Praise Yah. Be persistent. You know what? I'm here to share with you. Let's first go to Psalms chapter 139. Psalms 139 is something very important that Brother King David left us. A, he left us a jewel, and I'm so glad that I got to see this now because, like I said, many years ago I read this scripture. I'm quite sure you've read it to a thousand times. But with years and knowledge and wisdom, Yah was able to me to receive and to see something. Psalms chapter 139, I'm just going to read to you, well, let's read 13. He said, this is King David speak. He said, but thou hast possessed my reins. If you don't know, reins are like your inter organs, like your kidneys, your brain. He said that Yah had taken hold of his reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Don't tell me, Father Yah, don't see you in the womb. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And he's taking it personal. You can think, ooh, we. Oh, he's taking it personal because he said that he took possession of your reins and you snatched it out of there. Oh, he's taking it personal. Don't you think you're going to go unpunished? That's for another section. I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to come back to that, though. I'm coming back. Yah takes it personal when you touch the wound. Women's rights. Woo, we. Verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. King David is showing you something here. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know that your body has the ability to heal itself? Given the, the proper nutrients, the proper nourishment, and you take away certain things that you abuse your body with and get rid of that stuff and put in what you're supposed to, your body will heal itself. That's the truth. He knew that. That's why he said, my body is fearfully and wonderfully made. It has the ability to heal itself. Some of us out here are killing ourselves and asking for a prayer. That was me one time. See, I, I, I'm going to raise my hand again. That was me. It's still me at times. I'll tell you, I haven't cleared up everything. But I'm sitting in the office, right? My doctor's office. And my doctor's office came up to me. He said, uh, you know, we got your blood work, Mr. Wardlow. I said, well, thank you very much. Tell me just how healthy I am. He said, well, you are borderline diabetic. 
That's what he said to me as I'm sitting there with a hand fist full of M&Ms. Huh? What? I threw them M&Ms in the trash. Huh? <laughs> I threw them in the trash because a scripture came up to me, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 27. It said that too much honey is not good for you. That means something. Get off that sweet stuff. It's killing you. It's killing you. And as I start to do that, then your body start healing itself. Does that make sense? Sometimes Yahweh say, you don't have to ask me. Just study that beautiful body that I gave you. Go do some research. Because if I clean it up, you're just going to mess it up anyway. Continue doing the same old thing. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. May Yahweh bless you. In conclusion. In conclusion, we're going to wrap this up. And this here, for those of us who are lacking in the faith department, I just don't have the faith to, to heal or lay hands on nobody. I just don't quite yet believe that me, little old me has the power to go and lay hands in the sick recover. I just don't have that kind of faith. Well, guess what? We got, we got some news for you. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. In conclusion, I'm going to read you something for those of us who suffer with this little faith. We can't right get it. Look what Romans 10, 17 says. So then faith So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of Yahweh. If you're struggling with faith, Yah says it's coming. He's going to bring that faith to you. He said it'll come. But in order for it to come, all you have to do is keep reading his word. When I told my wife what I was working on, one day she came out there and she handed me so many scriptures. Oh, if, 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 if y'all would be mad at me, if y'all, you would be mad at me if I, if I, all the scriptures that she got, there's just tons of them in the scripture waiting on you to get your little eyes on and start reading and edify yourself and build your faith. It was just popping off. She was just, oh my goodness. I said, wow. This is just a smidget of faith building scriptures that you could grab a hold of to increase your faith. Yah says, keep reading, it'll come. May Yah bless you. May He bless your understanding. And may He keep you all in the precious name of His precious Son, Yahshua. Praise Yah. Shalom, everyone. My presentation is in this PDF format, and the title is The Journey, Your Adventure Begins Now. Well, some of us started our adventure for the Sacred Name Movement like 70 years ago. Some started 60 years ago, 50, 40, and then some probably will start now, right? Journey is 4550, must say. It's pulling up stakes. I did that one time, or probably twice already, when it transferred my, my tent from a different site in here. So I pulled stakes. Then some, something they said, breaking camp, setting out a station or a stage of your journey. From Miriam Webster, it says, something suggesting a travel or passage from one place to another. 
So you prepare for your journey, right? So my, our preparation was a year's preparation going here. So when we ended Sukkot 2022, we said we have to travel for the next Sukkot. So before this Sukkot started, we already been planning to come over here, right? So you have to define what this journey is for. So our journey, our definition for this journey is to be with our family here in Rushport this year. That's the definition. And for how long? We, we said we will take, two, for me it's two weeks of annual leave so that we have time to come here and then go back. Probably we will stop, be stopping somewhere else uh, along the road. And who's going, right? You, you have to find out who's going with you. Is, are the people that's going to come with you will going to make the journey easy or it's going to make it difficult for you, right? So I have to bring somebody who knows how to drive <laughs> so that it will be easier for me to travel towards my journey. What do I need to bring? My wife told me, we're just going to fly. But I said, I need a tent. And in the tent, I need this. And I need my, you know, uh, cooking uh, things. So I have to do a lot of preparation and a whole bu bunch. And our car is really full packed when we started from our place. Now you decide also what mode of transportation are you going to take, right? Motorcycles, probably somebody took the motorcycle, wherever you're coming from. Cars, helicopter, or probably I heard that boom, right? The boom, some, that would be fast, brother. Right? From New York to Rushport, in a twinkling of an eye, boom, you're landed here in our parking area. That would be fast. So you have to be preparing those things in the journey. Another thing is to decide what type of accommodation you want in the camp, right? Do you want to be camping with tent? Some, some will bring their RV. There will be a permanent dwellings or a hotel. I remember back in the old days, we tried doing the hotel here somewhere in Columbia. And I heard from my brother they really had a hard time booking hotels uh, this weekend. So it's our journey going to Rushport, 2023. It's about 1,400 miles. So if you start from Prescott and looking at that mileage, you're just going to wonder, when am I going to arrive, right? And with the time difference, of two hours, uh, what time am I arriving in the camp? So we arrived five, uh, five fifteen. Last uh, the last time, five fifteen, and I really immediately set up our tent before the sun sets. So that's our a little bit of our journey coming over here, and that's us. A little bit. Lou sleeps a lot in the car. But let's do a recount of Israel's journeys towards that promised land and probably see our own journey towards that promised land as well. And I'll be reading a lot of difficult names in here. And it's going to be in Numbers, Numbers 33, and I'll be reading 1 to 49. You just have to follow me. Here are the stages of the journey of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt by divisions under their leadership of Moshe and Aaron. Uh, he has command Moses recorded the stages in their journey. 
This is their journey by stages. And hopefully as I read this, you can pinpoint where are you in my journey as well. The Israelites set out from Ramses on the 15th day of the first month, the day after the Passover. They marched out boldly in view of all the Egyptians who were burying all their firstborn, whom Yahweh had struck down among them, for Yahweh had brought judgment in their mighty ones. The Israelites left Ramses and camped at Sukkot. They left Sukkot and camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. They left Etham, turned back to Pihahiroth, to the east of Baal Zephon, and camped near Migdol. They left Pihahiroth and passed through the sea into the desert. And when they traveled for three days in the desert of Etham, they camped at Marah. They left Marah and went to Elim, where there were 12 springs, 70 palm trees, and they camped there. They left Elim and camped by the Red Sea. They left the Red Sea and camped in the desert of Sin. They left the desert of Sin and camped at Dovka. They left Dovka and camped at Alush. And they left Alush and camped at Rephidim, where there was no water for the people to drink. They left Rephidim and camped in the desert of Sinai. And they left the desert of Sinai and camped at Kibroth Hatta Ava. They left Kibroth Hatta Ava and camped at Hazaroth. They left Hazaroth and camped at Ritma. They left Ritma and camped at Rimon Kures. They left Rimon Kures and camped at Livna. They left Livna and camped at Riza. They left Riza and camped at Kehelaka. 23. They left Kehelaka and camped in Mount Zephyr. They left Mount Zephyr and camped, up, camped at Harada. They left Harada and camped at Makalot. They left Makalot and camped at Tahat. They left Tahat and camped at Terah. They left Terah and camped at Mitka. They left Mitka and camp at Hashmona, and they left Hashmona and camp at Maserat. They left Maserat and camp at Bene Jacon. They left Bene Jacon and camp at Hor Hagid Gad. They left Hor Hagid Gad and camp at Jotbatha. And they left Jotbatha and camp at Abrona. They left Abrona and camp at Ezion Gibur. They left Izion Giver and camp at Kadesh in the desert of Zen. They left Kadesh and camp at Mount Hor on the border of Edom. At Yas command, Aaron the priest went up Mount Hor, where he died on the first day of the fifth month, on the fortieth year after Israelites came out of Egypt. Aaron was a hundred and twenty-three years old when he died on Mount Hor. And the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev of Canaan, heard that the Israelites were cam coming. And then they left Hor and camped at Salmona. They left Salmona and camped at Punon. They left Punon and camped at Uboth. They left Uboth and camped at Ye Abarim on the border of Moab. And they left Yim and camped at Dibon Gad. And they left Dibon Gad and camped at Almon Diblatayim. And they left Almon Diblatayim and camped on the mountains of Abarim near Nebo. And they left the mountains of Abarim and camped on the plains of Moab by the Jordan. Across from Jericho, there on the plains of Moab, they camped along the Jordan from Beth Heshimoth to Abel Shittim. And brothers and sisters, they are almost there. A lot of camping, right? And that's what we want. Probably in my lifetime, if I remember it correctly, because I, I think five years old when I have my remembrance, it's been 46 years that we've been camping for Sukkot. Yeah. So according to this Torah, it took the Israelites how many stops before reaching the promised land? That's a question, right? At what stop did they erect the tabernacle in the wilderness? 
Because from Egypt, they were just walking by themselves with their family, with a caravan probably, and we know that there are some, you know, sojourners with them and some belongings. But there was a time that they are going to erect that tabernacle as well as take it down and bring it with them. And Brother Roger uh, read that tabernacle, right? Probably will take them if it's a, you know, synchronized movement, probably a good half day or so to, to take it down. About how many times they disassembled and assembled the tabernacle? So because they have to stop, a lot of stops here, they have to assemble it back. Probably took the same time to assemble it back and put it in the right places. So according to Numbers 33, there were 41 stops. It's probably, there's probably a lot more, right? But according to what was written here, 41 stops. At what stop they did erected the tabernacles in the wilderness? On the 12th stop, they erected it. And they disassembled and assembled it 29 times. Don't you know that it's just about roughly 500 miles from Egypt to where they are really going. So if you're driving now without the police around, probably will take you the whole day just to get there. But this is how long they traveled going to that promised land. First up is from Ramses to Sukkot. Yahweh seen their affliction, heard their cry, and he knows their sorrows. Yahweh knows our afflictions as well. Hears our cries and knows our sorrows. That's in 1 Peter 5, 7. And, he, and that verse says, he cares for us. So wherever we are, as we go back to, to Arizona, we know that he hears us there as well. If we cry to him, he will hear us. Again, deliver them, bring them up out of the land unto a good land and large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites. So that's the promise. And it was a long time promise to them. Sukkot. Now we're celebrating the Feast of Sukkot, and that is 5523, and it's booth. This site where Jacob put up booths for his cattle and built the houses for himself, house for himself. It's east of the Jordan near the port of Torek, Jabok, and later allotted to the tribe of Gad. So in the theological workbook of the Old Testament, Sukkot means block, stop the approach, and shut off. Or cover. And that's what he did when the Egyptians were following them. Yahweh Elohim hid his people from the sight of those pursuing. He blocked them, stopped the approach, they got shut off and covered. Psalms 18:2 says, Yahweh is my rock. My fortress and my deliverer, my Elohim, is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. You just hold on to him and he is going to shield you. By the way, that is an overlooking my house in uh, Watson Lake, Prescott. That's why I know how the rocks look like. That's probably it, right? Rocky. The second stop is to go to Etham, that's in Numbers 33, 6. And this is already on the edge of the wilderness in Egyptian, it's HTM Hitam. So it's Shur in Hebrew, and that all means wall or fortress. So he is really hiding his people from danger. 
Exodus 14, 3 says, Pharaoh said, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in or walled them in. That's what he thinks, that people are wandering aimlessly. They are not. They are not. Yahweh put them in there, preparing them for something that's going to happen. That's why they, might, they ask, June, why did you guys went to Arizona? Right? My wife says, probably Yahweh is preparing us for something else. So Philo on the life of Moses, it says, not able to escape. They are not able to escape at that camp. Behind was the sea, in front was the enemy. On each side, a vast and pathless wilderness. That's why probably Pharaoh is saying, hey, I can overtake them. Because they are just wandering, wandering aimlessly in that juncture. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Sounds like the Shema, right? With all your heart, with all your strength, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Some people think that, oh, how come you joined that group? They don't know. They are just like Pharaoh. And we know Pharaoh got blinded by Yahweh Elohim and hardened his heart. But trust in Yahweh because he is the one that's going to guide our path. The third stop is Itham to Migdol. And Migdol is a watchtower. And we know that there is a lot of this in Egypt so that they can see their whole the whole country. And it's a military lookout post scattered across Egypt. And in their journey, that's where they are at in that circle. Fourth stop is Migdol to Mara. Oh, this is the bitter, salty water. And people grumbled. Right? People will grumble. In the journey to the promised land, it will be salty, bitter, and sometimes we grumble. I do. There's a tree, a known species, was thrown into the water, and the water became sweet, and they were able to drink the water in this fourth stop. At that fourth stop, statutes and regulation was made as well. Exodus 15, 22, 26, and it reads, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh, your Elohim, and do what is right in His sight. At what sight? Our sight? His sight. And give ear to His instructions and keep all His statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. For I, Yahweh, I am your healer. COVID happened, but he is the one who protects us. There is a song, right? Say, I'm still standing because of Yahweh Elohim. Fifth stop, Marat to Elim. There's 12 springs of water and 70 palm springs at that stop. That would be nice, right? Sounds like Palm Springs in California, an oasis. In our journey, brothers and sisters, we are allowed to rest and relax like what we are doing now. We have Leviticus 23 Shabbats, right? All of that, those things give us rest and fellowship with the brothers and sisters and relax a little bit. I'm not thinking of any work at this time. I'm just relaxing like that. It would be good if there's a fishing rod in there. <laughs> Psalm 62, 1. Truly my soul find rest in Yahweh. 
my salvation comes from him. Right? And we know who is that salvation. Yahshua is Yahweh's salvation. Sixth and seventh stop. They arrived in the wilderness of sin. And this is, again, another thorny area. There is a lot of thorns in our journey. I, I know that because we live in Arizona. There's a lot of cactus in there. <laughs> and on the 15th day of the second month, they camped to learn the Shabbat, man a cycle before moving to Dafka. The first thing that Yahweh did is to pull them out from the bandage. And then they went to the cleansing, represented by that Red Sea. Now they are learning His ways. Shabbat, mana cycle, and before they moved to Dafka. There are six days of manna. And then some people tried to collect manna on the prohibited day. And it's, it's a no good manna. Because you have to rest on a Shabbat day. There's grumbling in there as well. Also the place where Yahweh sent quails for them to eat. They said, manna again? Right. What day is this? Thursday? Manna? So they asked for some meat. And Jethro here advising Moses so that he will not you know, get, get used up the whole day just answering people's query. So he said, put some leaders or five tens and fifties and hundreds so that they will be the one to discuss their issues with. And for the difficult issues, they bring it to you. Eight and ninth stop. Again, difficult terrain. My son Gabriel, when we were transferring from San Francisco to Arizona, he, he mentioned, he said, Daddy, where are you bringing us? It is not even green here. Arizona is really, really brown. No, no, not a lot of greeneries. Right. So he said, and it's a difficult terrain. And my family did a lot of difficult things in Arizona. But Philippians 4.13 says, we can do all things through Mashiach because he strengthens us. Right? Whatever difficulty that may be, we might be eating manna from Monday to Friday, and we have some switches on the weekend, but with his help, he is going to strengthen us. The tenth stop is in Alush to Rephidim, and there was no water for people to drink. And they quarreled with Moshe, and Moshe stood at the rock of Horeb and struck it, and some water came out from that rock. And we know who's that rock that goes with them in the desert. In the pages of Torah, brothers and sisters, we can see Yeshua going with them all along till they reach that promised land. It's called Masa and Meribah because they tested Yahweh in there. Also, the Amalekites attacked and he was, they were defeated. Hosea was the one fighting and Moses held up his hands with Hur and Aaron helping his hands up. And they built, once they, they defeated the Amalekites, they built an altar and in, in Spanish it says, Yahweh es mi bandera. Yahweh me see. Yahweh is our banner. And that is all our banners, brothers and sisters. When, I, when they see us wherever we are and we raise Yahweh and Yeshua, they see that he is the one we're promoting. Eleven stop. Third month after Israelites left Egypt, they are there at the bottom. And Moses was called up on the mountain of Yahweh. And he said, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, I will establish you as a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation. And the people answered, we will do everything Yahweh said. And that is during baptism, we will say, whatever Yahweh is telling me to do from now on, I will do it. And that's a marriage vows. Exodus 20 is giving of the 10 words as well. At this stop is when that 10 words were given, 11th stop. The 12th stop, Desert of Sinai to Kibrot Ha'ataba, they loudly complain, complain about eating only manna. I guess ever since that first sin happened, it's about eating. It is about food. Yeah, we promised them so much meat now that they will eventually would vomit their, uh, through their nostrils. Yeah. And this is where, a 12 stop, this is where the tabernacle got erected on the 12 stop. On the first day of the first month, second year after they left Egypt. On the 12 stop. And the reason for Yahweh's tabernacle, it says there, let them make me a sanctuary that I may tabernacle among them. That's in Exodus 25, 8. And that's the only reason, because Yahweh Elohim really wants to be with his people. From this point forward, as I've said, they will now start assembling and disassembling and carrying that tabernacle in the wilderness with and bring it with them. Thirteenth, people abode at Azeroth, and here Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, and now there's Sara'at that happened to Miriam, a discoloration of skin. That's in Numbers 33, 17 to 18. 14 to 25 stop. A lot of things happen in there. 26 to the 31st. They are now closing in to where they are going. 37 stop is Izion Gibert to the wilderness of Zin. And this is where they buried Miriam, their sister. 33rd, Mount Hor. This is where Aaron died on Mount Hor at about 123 years old. So he passed three years, but the promise was 120 years. So three years exceeding. And this is 40 year new moon of the fifth month. And there King of Arad heard of the coming of the people of Israel. Now this is the 34th to the 41st stop. It's a lot of stops. So probably also with June, also with you guys, right? There's a lot of stages. There's a lot of journey. There's a lot of stops. And each stop, we learn something. In between leaving Egypt and entering the promised land, additional instructions or Torah were given, like how you will treat the slaves. You were slaves in Mitzrayim. Now I want you to be treating your fellow much better. Not only as a slaves, but as a brother, as a sister. Crimes, how to deal with crimes. Instructions for everyday life was cited in between their leaving Egypt and entering promised land. The priesthood were established in the wilderness, right? And this happens because people make an idol to worship. And now Moses says, if you are for Yahweh Elohim, stand beside me, and you know what happened. That's why they were picked. The sacrifices were established in that wilderness as well. And the reason for sacrifices, or korban, is to draw near. In order for you to draw near, you have to present a korban. And what's that for us? Right? Present yourself 
a le- as a holy sacrifice to Yahweh Elohim. Cleanliness instructions were given there. Blessings for obedience. And that's a good thing, right? Three times a year, we have to appear before Yahweh Elohim. And with your obedience, there will be blessings comes up. Also, curses for the disobedience. There's an instructions of no detour. No detouring. Deuteronomy 17, 11, according to the terms of the Torah, which they teach you, and according to the verdict, which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the word, which they declare to you to the right or to the left. And the second witness is in Deuteronomy 5.32. Be careful to do as Yahweh your Elohim has commanded you. You are not to turn aside to the right or to the left. Now I know the next question. June, what if I made a detour? Right. What if I made a detour? My GPS was, has brought me to a different route. And I listened to that GPS. I have to return to Shiva. Just like the prodigal son, right? I will go back to my father and he is going to forgive me. Deuteronomy 4.30 When you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days you will return to Yahweh your Elohim and then start listening to his voice. So for those who I love much, Start listening to his words. As we open the Torah cycle again after this feast, listen to him. Because definitely he's going to tell you a lot of things. So this is the promise. Exodus 6, 8. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. That's the promise. That's the same promise I'm holding on. It's the same promise I want you to hold on. This is our ultimate destination. Revelation 21, 1 to 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from Yahweh, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, Yahweh's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will tabernacle with them, same as what happened in the wilderness. It will happen to us in the future. They will be his people, and Yahweh himself will be with them and be their Elohim. And this is the nicest thing, right? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Right? No more thorns in that ragged Desert of Arizona for me. Right. If I touch that cactus or cacti, I won't get hurt anymore. May Yahweh give us the strength to finish our journey. Hallelujah. And now from Numbers, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 22. Number 622 says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Ye barachacha Yahweh vayishmarecha, Yair Yahweh panav elacha vihunecha, Yeshe Yahweh panav elacha vayashim lecha, Shalom. Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Hallelujah. 
For questions or comments, or to inquire about our DVDs or literature, contact Yowie's Assembly in Messiah by writing to YAIM 401 North Roby Farm Road, Rocheport, Missouri 65279, or visit us online at www.yaim.org, or call us at telephone number 573 698-4335.